I don't know if you can actually see it, but right here, there's a little black line with a little tiny ball on it. That's the camera. <laughs> That's my camera. It's the orbit sphere. Boy, has it been a problem. <laughs> I just got finished recording a, a uh, video talking about my wife and about other things. And it was uh, a little humorous because by the time I got done, the computer told me, no audio. I was like, okay, fine. So you just do it again till you get it right. Sometimes it drives me crazy because it should be simpler than that. And it is, honestly, but sometimes there's spiritual things going on. Sometimes it may be physical. Sometimes it may be just technological. Praise the Lord. If he wants it done, we get it done. So I was thinking that I haven't read this one before, you know, I was like, oh, wow. I was thinking about yesterday and how I had shared about my wife, you know, and the, the joy I had sharing that, that she likewise <laughs> surprised me with uh, showing me some videos of us dancing. I was surprised, that, well, not us, but me dancing. And uh, she had showed her girlfriends, and that embarrassed me, so it was kind of it was kind of cute. You know, I was kind of glad to be able to have fun, you know, and to relate that, you know, in a positive way on the Internet, because a lot of times people think that Christians don't know how to have fun. Well, that's not true. We have fun. Personally, I'll take you out dancing. <laughs> I don't know what anybody else will do, but I'll go dancing. <laughs> I love dancing. <laughs> you know, I mean, I've danced in Jerusalem. I've danced in Anchorage. You know, I, I've danced to Hora. You know, I've danced some ballroom. I've danced on uh, March for Jesus up in Anchorage through downtown Anchorage, Alaska. And then in the park. It's been fun. You know, I've had a lot of fun over the years with dancing. And... Uh, it's my way of just enjoying joy. <laughs> I don't even think when I'm dancing. I don't go out and work some moves down, you know, and do some break dancing, you know. I don't have to, you know, or... Because it just comes naturally for me. I don't know what it is. Maybe I'm just a clown or, you know, a fool for Christ. But I enjoy it. It's fun. And God wants you to have fun. You know, it's not like he comes along and says... I'm going to take away everything you enjoy, you know, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I'm going to give you condemnation, conviction, and conformity. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> if you're under any of those, you know, condemnation, conformity, conviction, you might not want to go there. <laughs> May I suggest that you talk to God about it? Maybe he'll take you somewhere else. But that's kind of kind of where people have gotten a bad rap, you know, I mean, I know there's churches out there that really are like that, you know, they, they have a very set order, you know, they're, they're almost like the Orthodox, you know, I've been inside Orthodox community, I know what it's about, I know what it's like, very regimented, very segmented into its portions of the day, and its duties, and its order. God, when he came in the form of Jesus, you know, as the Son of Man, when he came as man, and he came as God, he told us that the wind bloweth with her will, you neither know where it's coming from nor where it's going, so it was everyone led by the Spirit of God. So a lot of what we need to do in living a complete life or a fulfilled life is to recognize that the Spirit of God is working in us to create through us the opportunity to have conversation with God and to discuss things that maybe we don't understand and we don't completely comprehend because it's not a question of just oh blind faith and you know go there but it's one of 
developing a faithful relationship with God, that your faith is exercised in your relationship as you walk with God, doing those things that are pleasing in your sight and doing those things that He wants you to as He's asked you to. It's not all experience, which is experiential, and you know, like get into all this, you know, you've heard the terminology and the theological terms are there, but why do we use them, you know, when they're not true? Because it's not all about only experiencing God and just relationship. It's not only about all faith and, you know, doing dogmatism. But rather, there's a balance of the reality of God speaking and having a communication with the relationship that He has with you. Because the relationships can be distant or far, close or near. I mean, it's not all relationship, but it's not all religion. It's kind of a mixture, sort of. You know, it's more like knowing. <laughs> and when you know God, hey, God will take you there. But I've always enjoyed, I think, knowing that wherever I went, I could take God with me. And that's probably the most important lesson for you to learn if you have, as it were, the freedom and the liberty to dance, maybe to sing, maybe to worship, maybe to do ballet or <laughs> do break dancing or in other areas or other venues. If you're a football player ugh, or a baseball player ugh, or an athlete, ugh. you know, I've done it, you know, but I'm not one of those mega, you know, memorized fantasy football idol worship this kind of thing routine because personally I see too many gods of men in some of the professional sports that we do. And I don't think that's what God intended for Christians to be about, you know. Frankly, you know, if I was looking at, you know, the Roman Empire, and then I started looking around America, I'd kind of be thinking, you know what, sports isn't that far off of it. <laughs> but if God's telling you to, hey, you know, go for it. You know, however he works, that's the way he works. But I think it's a little idol worship there. But you know, God uses us where we're at to do what we do as He chooses. And all we need to do is to enjoy more so that relationship with Him, to take Him with us and to involve Him in all we do. Then we become more enjoying what it is we're doing. It's pretty simple. If you can bring God in it, you're going to enjoy it more. If you can't bring God in it, you're going to enjoy it less. That makes sense to you? <laughs> That's the way you test whether or not it's godly or manly or we would say fleshy. Morality by public pressure is not morality. For so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. 1 Peter 2.15 Carnal fear may take either of two opposite directions. It may make us afraid to do what we know we should do, or afraid not to do what we have reason to think people expect us to do. The conscience versus the expectation, I guess. There is a foolish consistency which brings us into bondage to the consciences of other people. Peer pressure. But this morality by public pressure or peer pressure is not pure morality at all. At best, it is a timid righteousness of doubtful parentage. At worst, it is the child of weakness and fear. A free Christian should act from within with a total disregard of the opinions of others. If your morality is based upon what you are told only, then you really don't have a moral character. You have a obedient structure of religion. Because morality has to come to a place where it accepts a certain standard of behavior because of what it sees that it causes in effect. The willingness to examine the truth and say that that's not going to be beneficial to other people and that God would not necessarily want that. Or to be able to examine it and say this is something that is good that we should do for other people because we have examined it and we know that God wants us to do it.
Because morality is that nature of God that is in us to cause us to see what is right as opposed to what is wrong. So it's either moral or immoral. There is no gray areas of morality. It's pretty obvious. There is forgiveness for immoral behavior because you know that based upon moral character, you transgressed that morality that God has given. Transgressed means you crossed over. You went beyond the line in the sand. You did something you knew what was wrong. And you committed sin. You separated yourself from God. You missed the mark of what God was trying to get you to learn and to accomplish. Because if sin is missing the mark, then what you're really looking at is, when you say sin, you're missing the point. You're missing the idea. You're missing the direction. You're missing that which God wants you to do. Because people too often get this sin thing as being like, you know, these immoral thoughts, behaviors, or actions. No, it's missing what God wants you to do. Sin can be as simple as just simply God said, do it, and you didn't. That's all. That's sin. Or God said, stop, and you went. That's sin, to be honest, because you missed what he wanted you to do. So you ask forgiveness and you move on. That's really what it's all about. That's the nature of sin. That's the point of what the word hate in Hebrew, sin in English, means. It is a term for taking a bow and shooting towards the mark and hitting the bullseye. And frankly, if you missed it, you missed it. <laughs> I mean, there's no two ways around it. You know, you're scoring 100 or you're not. You know, you either went for the gold and got it, or you didn't, you know? And that's what sin is. Did you get the gold? Okay. You're not in sin. If you didn't get the gold, you're in sin. Jesus gives us that opportunity to not sin by restoring to us a means with which we could find out what we are supposed to do so that we do what we should do. And that's what moral conscience is. The morality to do what you should do when you should do it. Sounds simple to me. <laughs> you hear God say no, don't do it. You hear God say yes, do it. That's about as easy as it gets. A free Christian should act from within with a total disregard of the opinions of others. If a course is right, he should take it because it's right. Not because he is afraid not to take it. Any act done because we are afraid not to do it is of the same moral quality as the act that is not done because we are afraid to do it. You don't do it because you're afraid God's going to condemn you, and you don't not do it because you're afraid God's going to condemn you. You do it or don't do it because it's the right thing to do. When you are in love, you do those things that you please the person with. You choose to do those things because you want to. You know, why do you go out and buy flowers after you've blown it? when you should be buying flowers before you've blown it because you care for the person that loves flowers. Guys don't get it. Women appreciate the flowers because they don't get them otherwise. <laughs> so make it a point. Make it a choice. Make it a direction to always do those things that are pleasing in the sight of your father. And you'll see that they're pleasing in the sight of man. For when a man's ways please God, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. So, hey, there's a good way to get around being in trouble. Please God. The way to escape this double snare is simple. Make a complete surrender to God. Love him with all your heart and love every man for his sake. Determine to obey your own convictions as they crystallize within yourself as a result of unceasing prayer and constant study of God's Word. When you read it, hey, you know, I'll admit there are people that, you know, they'll read the Ten Commandments and they'll go, hey, you know what, I'm going to keep the Sabbath and I'm going to, you know, be make it holy and I'm going to like, you know, on every Saturday I'm going to go to church and I'm going to do this, that, and the other thing and I'm going to tell everyone else that they're going to hell if they don't. Wait a minute. <laughs> Where did we go from you're doing what you think is right with your conscience according to what's for you to suddenly you're going to condemn everyone else? <laughs> that's dumb. That's only for you. You know, if, if that's what you need it and think it and want it and go for it, then do it. And see how it works for you. If it doesn't work, hello. 
And some people don't need to go to the Sabbath on Saturday because they have a Sabbath in their heart. They've rested from their works. They're not trying to do anything particularly holy on any day because they know that every day is holy. For them, they've made it holy by including God in it. Again, we're back to put God in it, and you'll get out of it. Keep God out of it, and you're going to get in it with God. <laughs> Believe me. And he will put you in it. After you have safely ignored the expectations of your friends as well as criticisms of your enemies, you will experience the first shock surprise of the regimented army of lockstep believers and then their grudging admiration. You see, when you decide to walk with God, he walks with you and he takes you to the place where to everyone else who's been telling you what to do, you look like you're holy. Wow, check him out, man. He's walking with God. He looks pretty shiny. Matter of fact, he seems to glow. Wonder what he knows that I don't know. How come I'm just trudging along here doing my thing? I'm reading and doing, reading and doing, reading and doing. Don't do. Walk. Walk with God today. Talk with God today. Be led by God today. Listen to God today. Talk to God today. Have a relationship with God today. Even have a religion with God today. You see, it's all about with God today. Because if God is with you, I think he's going to tell you what to do. And I think you can learn how to do that by reading his word, by sharing it with others. Hey, you know, what's this thing Jesus said? He said, you know, my sheep hear my voice. You know what I mean? Do you really hear his voice? And he'll say, yes, you can. As a matter of fact, that was my plan all along, that you would talk to me and I would talk to you. So, why not? Let God lead you and God will guide you. Let God guide you and he will provide for you as God leads, guides, and provides. Why would you want to do anything else? Why indeed?